Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, hello. OK, yes. we can hear you, Myrtle. Let's, let's get started since it's three o'clock. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted that you've joined us in the third of our Business Week special sessions. I want to ask that you please turn your microphones off during the presentation and afterwards, if you have a question, please raise your hand or put your question in the chat, which I will monitor. Today's session is a keynote by Mr. Roland Parrish, whom I'm so happy has joined us. He is currently CEO of Parrish Restaurants Limited, which owns and operates 27 McDonald's restaurants in Dallas and surrounding areas. The Dallas Business Journal ranks his company as the fourth largest minority owned firm in North Texas. Mr. Parrish is highly committed to giving back to the community, especially causes that support the education and welfare of youth, including funding the Parrish Career and Development Center, which is currently under construction at Fisk University and is scheduled to open in 2022, among many other contributions to the well being of others. Mr. Parrish received his BS and MBA from Purdue's Cranert School of Business. Welcome, Mr. Parrish. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bill. I'm going to presume that I'm audible. Most of the cameras are off. Uh, if you could just give me a thumbs up, um, but I presume I'm audible. So uh, what I want to talk about today, uh, oh, can we get the slides up? Yes. Uh, okay. Let's see, slides. Is can you see the slides? Uh, yeah, outstanding. Great. So obviously I'm honored here to be uh, honored to be here with the uh, UTA uh, officers, faculty, administrative, friends, students at your uh, business week. So if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, my logo and we got our start uh, as a franchisee in the Dallas area back on Juneteenth of 1989 is when we first opened. So what I want to do today, if we go to the to the next slide, is um, talk about my path from Exxon Corporation into McDonald's and talk about how I became, um, I'm going to say a philanthropist. In 2015, after being in business for about 25 years at Dallas uh, Morning News, called me a philanthropist in the paper. And I'll tell you the truth, when I graduated from college, I probably didn't know what a philanthropist was. It just didn't run in those circles. So I want to talk about how um, I've grown as a business and have grown to be, to me, more socially responsible and how that came about. So let's kick it off with um, the next slide. After about 11 years with Exxon, I uh, filled out an eight-page application to become a franchisee. And I classify myself, classify myself as a winner. I was a student athlete, I made the dean's list about, uh, well, six times out of eight semesters undergrad and was working on it went and graduated with an MBA degree. And in college, I taught probability and statistics to fund my way through graduate school. But I filled out an application in 1986 and I was rejected. Um, and I'll tell you the one, the one, the one thing that resonated because I did call McDonald's for about two months straight every Monday, Wednesday and Friday to find out why I was uh, rejected. And I call that a lesson, lesson of perseverance was that during my time at Exxon, which I did work in distribution, I worked in engineering, I worked in um, uh, retail, I worked in uh, financial planning. But the one thing that resonated was while I was at Exxon, I learned how to I learned how to run service stations and even with an MBA, a master's degree. I actually had to work to Pump Island and I ran a service station in Lehigh, Arkansas, 15 service stations in Jackson, Mississippi. So it was that retail background once I was able to get them on the phone that resonated with them, not, not my education. So once I was accepted into the program, for two years, I, I worked 15 hours, 50 hours a week for Exxon. I commuted 10 hours a week and I worked 25 hours a week free in a McDonald's. So that's for two years, 25 hours a week free. So I had an 85 hour work week. And the reason for the 25 hours was to, be, to learn the McDonald's system and also to learn the McDonald's culture. Okay, so next slide. So all of this training was in Houston, Texas. When I got an opportunity 
to open a restaurant and have my own, I was channeled to Pleasant Grove and we may have some individuals from Pleasant Grove and I really love Pleasant Grove, but it is a, a tough area of town. It is a tough area of town. And these are some clippings that talk about Pleasant Grove, but I didn't hesitate because I did want my piece of the pie. I did want my Big Mac. I did want to live my dream. So next slide, please. Some of you may have seen, there's a movie with Michael Keaton uh, playing Ray Kroc. Ray Kroc is the founder of McDonald's system, Systems. Uh, the McDonald's brothers started McDonald's, but he was the person that really grew um, McDonald's as a brand. Uh, his, his autobiography, Grinding It Out, and then a book called Behind the Arches by John Love really talk about that. But one of the things that, that happened if you became a franchisee was the day you opened, you had to give $500 to charity. And so your life saving is, is in this restaurant. I've worked two years free. And then when I open up, I've got to give to a charity. And I remember I cut a check for $500 to the local YMCA in Pleasant Grove. And so that began to, to, to set off the, uh, you got to give to charity. And a lot, a lot of um, activities you did back then was for a basketball team, a football team, a pop winner, little league, cheerleaders, and things like that. So uh, next slide, please. To give you an idea of my first 11 years in business, how we began to grow a little bit. Um, oh, next slide, Dr. Bill. Maybe, maybe, we're, maybe we're stuck. Um, and it's, it's a great movie. I think the movie, uh, some people walk away having a negative opinion of Ray Kroc, but He's very family oriented. He had Going a vision stick and plan. Are okay. we there now? Okay. Yes. Yeah, we're there. And just briefly, just to let you know, so now during this this next next ten to eleven years, I'm sponsoring again little leagues, football, um, cheerleaders, and there was even a time I wanted to do something different. So we sponsored a chess tournament for a couple of years, like in the Pleasant Grove area. So uh, next slide, please. The first time I, I thought about supporting something that was bigger than just my local area was 9-11. Um, and some of you may be too young, some of the underclassmen, to know about 9-11. But during this catastrophe to the United States, the McDonald's owners in New York City had an 18-wheeler, and it was a mobile restaurant. And so they set up this mobile kitchen uh, close to ground zero, and that's where the Twin Towers uh, collapsed, ground zero. And they fed the firemen and the policemen and all of the rescue workers. And so our co-op, we have advertising co-ops, and so the 60 or so McDonald's franchisees who are in North Texas, we have an advertising co-op where we pull up, pool our money, where we advertise on TV, radio, um, billboards, and other um, uh, media. And the group was trying to come together on what we're going to do for New York City. Now, New York City um, was like a ghost town. No one was traveling. No one was flying. The theaters were empty. The restaurants were empty. And we were trying to decide, or the group, if we take five cents per every French fry sold, and maybe we could pull our money and send it to New York. And as a, as a young guy, I'd only been in 11 years. I said, we said, well, why don't we go to New York? Let's work in the truck. Let's, let's help cook and clean and feed firemen and policemen, then at night we could go to the restaurants, we could go to the plays, and no one no one wanted to do it. And in the end, we didn't do anything. We didn't send a nickel per fry. No one went to New York. We did nothing. And so that stuck with me. Next slide, please. Um, so in the next couple of years, I'm growing, becoming financially stronger, still supporting like little leagues and, and basketball teams and things like that. Next slide, please. So in 2005, a Hurricane Katrina hit in New Orleans. And that was very devastating. Another city that was devastated, this time due to natural causes. And so after a few phone calls and encouragement, um, I was asked, why didn't I try to help? There was a husband and wife team who were in the, um, the Metairie area which is a little bit, a suburb, like a little bit west of New Orleans. And so I took a team of 12 individuals, 12 of my employees, and we went down because they had one restaurant was flooded. The other restaurant was above ground. They had power, but they had no employees. They had like one employee mm -hmm. and their home was flooded. 
the closest that they could find to live was in Baton Rouge, which was about 60 miles away in a Motel 6. So here's a family, their home is devastated. One of their businesses is underwater. Uh, they have one employee and it was just really tough on them to try to get things done, try to have the restaurant open and all the things that you can imagine. And I remember coming from the airport, we came into the New Orleans airport. There was not a business open. There was nothing open. The rental car facility was open and we got our three rental cars. And I remember when we, we drove to the restaurant, which was, um, I think that's Veterans Boulevard in, um, in Metairie. That day, the wind was blowing from the south, uh, southwest, southeast, and the stench of death was in the air. And that mm. first day, I didn't know if I could, if I could even make it a week. Luckily, the remainder of the week, the air uh, blew from the north, from Lake Pontchartrain, so it was fresh air. But anyway, we worked that week, and we were open probably eight hours a day, and we, have, we were having record sales. And the only thing I regret is, if I had to do it again, I would have taken, I would have gone for a month and just rotated people out. Um, and so that to me was the first time that I reached out beyond just my local um, restaurants to um, to help franchisees. And I put it to bill: travel, hotel, food for my employees, and I paid my employees. So that was the first time we reached out. So next slide, please. We've been began to expand, and we've done this for about 17 years now. We've given bikes at Christmas time to needy children. Uh, we partnered with the local school districts. And here's some just photos of uh, bikes that we've given away. I know we're approaching probably like 3,000 bikes that we've, we've given away over time. So again, just from that genesis of $500 to the YMCA, we began to expand uh, our giving. Next, next slide, please. Um, Dr. Harry Robinson uh, is the president and CEO of the African American Museum, which is located in Fair Park. And this is a, uh, the Texas Black Sports Hall of Fame, a statewide event that was being sponsored by Frito-Lay, a Fortune 500 company. And about eight, nine years ago, Frito-Lay walked away from the African American Museum, um, just walked away. And Dr. Robinson gave me a call and I was like, Dr. Robinson, I don't think I'm that big yet to sponsor something like that. But we hashed out a deal and so I've been the sponsor now probably about 11 or 12 years. And we're, this is just kind of really cool. I put a slide together of some of the people that we've inducted into the uh, Texas Black Sports Hall of Fame. And, and these four individuals are all um, in the NFL Hall of Fame. So you have uh, Minjo Green from uh, UNT, uh, Charles Haley, Dallas Cowboys, Tim Brown, uh, Woodrow Wilson High School, and then uh, Roger Staubach received a special award. It was really interesting. Roger had just, Mr. Starbuck had just gone to one of my restaurants to drive throughs the night before, and I wanted to make sure that he had a had a good order. He ordered a flail fish. I said, "Well, at night, sir." Let's see. So there's a book I read in the '90s, and I reread uh, sometime later about a gentleman named Reginald Lewis. And Reginald Lewis at one time was the, the richest black man in America. And he gave um, a $3 million endowment in the late 90s to Harvard Law School, which at that time was the largest uh, gift uh, given to Harvard at that time. And I was just so impressed, so impressed. Are we hung up, Dr. Bell, on that one? No, your voice faded out. I didn't hear you when oh. you said it, but okay. Okay, all right. There we go. Sorry about that. Sorry. Okay, so, so hopefully everyone, so this book, uh, Reginald Lewis, who became the, um, at one time, the richest African American male or African American man in, uh, in the United States. What's interesting about this book is he was able to get into Harvard Law School without filling out an application. It's almost worth reading your book just, just because of that. But I, I was so impressed with um, this book. It just, gave me a, a new life and a new vision of what I wanted to do with my company. So if we'll go to the next slide, please, Dr. Bell. So I'm continuing to grow um, more restaurants, more sales, more employees. And next slide, please. And we, um, because of the, the Reginald Lewis book, I began to expand my, um, I guess, gifts 
to uh, various institutions. So the Parish Library of Management and Economics, we made a deal with uh, Purdue University in 2010, and that opened in 2012, which is the first um, major facility at Purdue University to be, to be named after an African-American. And then uh, we opened a medical clinic in 2016 in Fort Porter, Uganda. And then Dr. Bell mentioned that we have a career development center that will open in 2022 at Fisk University. OK, if you can. Next slide, please. And I tried to to pull things to a little more current. Um, I always call myself a small. Uh, business man rather than an entrepreneur, because McDonald's is basically uh, systems oriented and I bought a few new ideas to McDonald's, but basically. It's it's um, it's a myriad of systems uh, and mastering the systems and teaching systems and having people who could uh, expedite and uh, execute the systems is the key. One of the keys to McDonald's. So the next few slides I want to talk about what I see more as social justice and economic empowerment, especially to the African-American community or our communities of color. So next slide, please. I think it was about. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, I, I picked up this book uh, by Maggie Anderson called Our Black Year. This young lady uh, was living on the west side of Chicago, and one morning she woke up and she wanted to find a grocery store that was in the city of Chicago, I think the third largest city in the, in the U.S. that was owned by an African-American. And basically, eventually she found one grocery store that was actually owned by an African-American, and it took some time. And so with that, um, next slide, please. In her book, she talks about retail economic leakage. And what this is, is for every $100 spent in a given community, how long it turns, how long it stays in that community before it exits. So in the general market, our Anglo community, $100 spent in retail will stay in that community for 17 days before it exits. In the Jewish community, community 20 days. In the Asian community, 30 days. That $100 spent in that Asian community will work in that Asian community before it leaves. And in the African-American community, six hours, a quarter of a day. And so that's that resonated with me more than anything in a book, economic leakage. So next slide, please. So I had been subtly conscious but I became more conscious of ensuring in most of the, the businesses that I deal with are smaller businesses. But I, I ensured that I was putting my money back into the African-American community and community and the community of color because most of my restaurants are located in those areas. So landscaping, advertising and, and black um, uh, newspapers, uh, several of them, uh, African-American CPA, I actually have an African-American Harvard trained attorney. Uh, security um, security companies that are African American owned, uh, and then from a national scale, I don't put it on my resume, but I was the national chair of the National Black McDonald's Owners Operators Association, which has sales of 3.6 billion, and I was an advocate for uh, African American suppliers. And during my uh, my time in office, we moved from 750 million in procurement to 1 billion. So that's something that I was conscious of, and that to me. George Floyd incident this summer, uh, there's been more of a conscious effort by corporate America to, to spread the wealth. So this is, I believe, my last slide, uh, maybe two slides ago. Uh, next slide, please, Dr. Dr. Bill. Uh, one of the local mega church ministers talks about lanes, uh, lanes, and he has these areas where he feels that minorities experience inequities in education, housing, from an economic standpoint, business or commerce and healthcare, a criminal justice system. And so I, I look at this and say, I am not large enough to check a box in every one of these areas. But in education, I give multiple scholarships in different areas. You saw the libraries that services uh, students, the career center that were service students. Um, from a business and commerce standpoint, I talked about what I've done from a national standpoint and also for supporting black business. Healthcare, the next slide will speak to that. Uh, who will go to the next slide, please? I am the, for those who are in the, maybe the, um, 
the Dallas area, the Oak Cliff area. Uh, I'm part of uh, an investment group. Uh, Peter Brodsky leads it. He's the number one investor. And he told me I could say I'm number 1A. I always said I was the number two investor that I, I'm 1A. But we're, we are refurbishing and rebuilding that uh, Redbird Mall. And of the facilities that we're bringing in, Parkland is building a 40,000 40, square foot clinic. And the University of Texas Southwestern is building a 100,000 square foot clinic. So in that manner, I'm bringing, helping, helping to bring health care to the community in addition to the um, Uganda clinic that we have for children. So with that, I've kind of walked through just different steps of how I've gone from the $500 that I spent with a YMCA or donated to a YMCA to how I've grown to be called a philanthropist with the Dallas Morning News. And with that, I'd like to open it up for, for questions. So Dr. Bell, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you to manage. And okay. why don't we have a little excitement today? So if you ask a question and you're undergraduate, we want to get your information, and at the end of the day, um, someone's going to win a $3,000 scholarship. Um, I'll have a Dr. Bell and maybe Mary Beth, who is our, um, our engineer today. They'll decide how we award it, but a $3,000 scholarship to an undergraduate. So that means if an undergraduate asks a question, you have to give us your name. Okay, thank you. Well, that's terrific. So do we have any questions from undergraduates or anybody else who is not an undergraduate, but who still has a question they want Mr. Parrish to answer? Okay, I'm trying to see the questions in the chat. We had a problem logistically, so people were having trouble getting in. Mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing messages that say, awesome, Mr. Parrish. Okay, I have one question for you. Um, any undergraduates raising hands before I start with the questions? I'm not seeing any any hands. So, Felisa, if you would let me know if you see any hands, please. OK, but one question is, how important do you see education to be, such as higher education, as a key to financial success? I think that education is a window of opportunity. It's the great equalizer. Uh, I would say in a given year, I probably give and I need to do a better job of tracking, but in a given year, I may give fifty, sixty thousand dollars in scholarships to uh, to young people, and so I think that I think education is the key. It's it's the window of opportunity. It's the portal. It's the great equalizer. So I think I probably put that number one. You know, behind it is discipline and things like that. But I think someone trying to to get their education and higher education is key. That's key. OK, thank you for that. Of course, I like to hear that. Um, and uh, maybe that was a plant question, but I'm really glad to, to hear you say that. And I can tell by where you're supporting students that that really does matter to you. OK, other questions. OK, here's one. Mr. Parrish, what would you say on how to educate our youth in regards to financial stability and success. This is from Luis Fernando Batres. Luis, are you a an undergraduate student? Good afternoon. Yes, I am. OK, terrific. Um, obviously, there are, there are multiple ways. Uh, one one organization I've really been impressed with is Junior Achievement, um, and I'm not sure what level they start, um, but they teach in addition to how to start a business, just how to, to set up a budget, your personal budget. Uh, I'm not sure that we have that as a curriculum in the in the uh, like the various school systems, but I think that that discipline is is something that should come through organizations like that. And it's great if parents can understand it and teach it. I always say I learned my discipline financially from my father with um, I had 70 cents a week as an allowance, so a quarter went to church, a dime went to Sunday school, a quarter went in the piggy bank, and anything I bought, I had to work off of that 10 cents. And so some of you may remember 45s. If I went to buy a 45 record that cost a dollar, I had to I had to I had to save 10 dimes, 10 weeks in order to buy that. But that discipline from from capital budgeting, if it can start at home, great. If not, organizations like Junior Achievement um, and maybe the churches have to get involved and schools may have to teach that earlier budgeting. 
Okay, thank you. That's a really good question, Luis. And we we at UTA, for those of you who don't know, have a financial literacy program and we try to educate the undergraduate students. I think it really does matter. And I think that's a really good question, Luis, because sometimes students leave college with so much debt and not knowing how to manage it and then it's a hole that it's hard to get out of so thank you for that okay i see a whole bunch of hand hands raised i'm seeing a hand from at that's alexis do you want to ask your question alexis hi um earlier you spoke about uh, how your experience your retail experience was what McDonald's was actually interested in versus your education. And I know once we graduate and then we're applying for jobs, a lot of us don't have a lot of hands on experience. And so what would your advice be to us as far as like getting experience when we're applying for certain jobs? Yeah, I, I think if any any job that you have, say if, if you started in high school, um, I mean, almost doing anything to interact. Um, if there's any way to put them on your resume, you do that. And then things begin to drop off. Um, I was trying to, you know, I, I, I threw papers. I was a paper boy when I was young. And I don't think that was on my first college resume. But it could come up in the interview that, you know, preparing the papers, getting them out, whether it rained or snowed, and then collecting the money, sending your money into the newspaper, that you know the responsibilities there. I I think if if a person could work retail because now everything is is so much online, people don't interact, and and even though we're moving that way, even at the front counters like in McDonald Land and, and the quick serve restaurants, just interacting with people, uh, the team that you have that's trying to prepare the food and, and deliver it, and interacting with the customer, I think that those are are great. And if you have a job in a small whatever it is, a mom and pop where you have to supervise somebody, even if it's one or two people and learn the concepts, concepts of teamwork. So I think the part, the part-time jobs, even if they're part-time, you could, you could position them on your resume to, um, to make sense. I had, I had no idea that McDonald's would resonate on my running a service station in Lehigh, Arkansas, where I had to clean restrooms. And some of you may remember, I walked out and had to pump gasoline six steps around the car, um, wash the windshield and the tail lights and things like that. So I didn't realize that that would resonate, but it did. So I think part-time jobs, even if you can't have full-time jobs, are real significant. And then after that, it's it's volunteering if it's in your church. Um, I know there's a separation of church and state. If you teach Sunday school, um, just things like that, I think, I think help to uh, talk about your interacting with, with people and leadership. That's Thank a you. great. That's a great question. Thank you, Alexis, for that question. I see some other hands up. Let's see. And I can't get to them. There's so many people. OK, there's another um, question in the chat. And OK, so this is from Jarrett Orange Dixon. What are some challenges that you've had to overcome with your company? Some. Um I kind of chuckle at some of the challenges. We could go a couple different avenues, but I'm going to give you some that are from a not from a national perspective. Uh, in 1996, there was an airline pilot strike um, that was threatened, and President Clinton. Um, I think the strike lasted somewhere between a minute and an hour, and his presidential authority, he was able to cancel the strike. And I, I don't know if it was all of the pilots or just American Airlines. And at that time, I was trying to open up two restaurants in the DFW airport. And we, I had something like a hundred employees and we had not opened that I had to pay while I trained them. And we of course couldn't wait for that first day to open. And it coincided when the pilots were gonna strike. And I was like, what am I gonna do? If, if we don't open, I don't know if I could meet the next payroll. But luckily the president, um, he uh, canceled the strike with his authority. And so that was tough. 9-11 was tough because in addition to being the young guy that wants to go to New York, and, and work for free in that 18 wheeler and did enjoy the city, uh, people stopped flying. So I had four restaurants at that time, two, two in Pleasant Grove and two in the airport. So half of my revenues basically disappeared because people weren't flying. So one thing I've learned, and I could give you instances like that where for some reason the sales uh, evaporated, 
But I've always, and what I've learned in school and what I've learned from, from my parents was the financial discipline. So I built a strong balance sheet. Some, some of the things, if you're in accounting or finance, um, I make sure that I have plenty of working capital. My debt coverage ratios are very, very strong and healthy. And I live beneath my means. If any time a person wants to start a business, I tell them one of the main things, it, you, you need to learn how to live beneath your means. Live beneath your means. You need to repeat that. Uh, Dr. Bell mentioned that I have over 20 uh, restaurants. And I probably live like I have four or five. And I know people with two or three McDonald's that live large and live larger than me. So their financial statements have to be weaker. So learn to live beneath your means. Live beneath your means. You can repeat that. I was just about to repeat that and tell everybody to take that to heart. Write that down, students and everyone listening. Um, so that question was from Jared. Jared, are, are you an undergraduate student? Yes, ma'am, I am. Great, thank you for that question. That was an insightful question with an insightful answers that can help us all. Okay, so some other questions. If anybody wants to take their um, mic off and speak an undergraduate student, because I'm seeing hands raised, but I can't uh, see who you are. There's so many people here. I can go ahead. Okay, say your name, please. It's Melissa Ozar. I'm also an undergrad student. Um, so what do you enjoy about your role and what's your favorite thing about your job? OK, I heard part two. What's my favorite thing about my job? Can you repeat the first part? Uh, what do you really enjoy about your role? Oh, my role? OK. Yeah. OK. OK, I'm going to go to part two. One, I really enjoy people, even though, even though people can be a problem and headache. I really love my employees. Uh, we were asking someone asked my employees like what what was our company about? And my employees were saying, we're like a family. They kept saying we're about a family. And I thought they'd talk about, oh, we can really execute. We can push drive through. We give the freshest, hottest food. And they're like, we're family, we're family. So I've had employees that have been with me over 30 years. And so you go through everything, births, deaths, um, graduations, uh, divorces, marriages. I mean, you name it. So we are a family, we are a unit. And we're actually in an elite unit, um, but I really enjoy the people. Now, the role I enjoy is my function in my company. I'm the chief. I mean, I'm the owner, but I'm the chief, uh, the CEO, chief executive officer, and I'm the chief financial officer. I joke, even if my kids get in business, I will still be the chief financial officer <laughs> because I, I feel I have a gift to manage money. But I really enjoy those roles now. But I'm going to tell you, it was really tough. If you think about it, two years you're working 50 hours a week in corporate America. You're commuting 10 hours a week. So that's 60 hours already. And then you have to go to a McDonald's and put on a uniform, clean restrooms, cook burgers for free for two years. And so there are a lot of tough times. There are times I tell people when I would open, I would open the restaurant, I get there at 5 a.m. to open at 6 a.m. And then when the day passed, maybe the night, the night manager didn't come in, I had to close the restaurant. So I had plenty of 12 and 18 hour days. So those were not fun. When I look back now, I'm glad that I had the, the fortitude and energy to do that. But I enjoy the people. I enjoy the role as a CEO and the role as a um, chief financial officer. Dr. Bell, I don't know if you could get the last slide I have. I also enjoy reading about CEOs. There's a slide I have. It's in the appendix after questions. And it's, it's, it's I think it's about five or six books that, um, there you go. Yeah, yeah, go back one. And so you could look at that screen. These are my business heroes. Lee Coco, he was a uh, CEO of uh, Ford Motor Company and also Chrysler. Ed Whitaker, Texas guy, AT&T uh, CEO in General Motors. Um, Robert Iger, Disney, great stories. So uh, I enjoy reading about CEOs. So anyway, next question. But, but I, those are the roles I enjoy. OK, well, next question. You. And that was <laughs> Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Another question, please, from an undergraduate. Any questions? Yesenia Gonzalez, I see your hands has been, have been raised for a while. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. OK, um, my um, question is, what would your advice be to students who come from minority families 
who have that struggle of finance or never got taught because their parents didn't have the knowledge and are struggling with being a student or getting out of school with so much debt that regardless of the job, they're still drowning. Yeah, well, I first from a family standpoint, I always tell people if you can learn a family story that will motivate you. So even though, I mean, you talk about poor, I have a story about my grandfather who would make something like 10 cents a week during the depression. And if you're real briefly, his story was he would have to put wire mesh in his boots because they had holes in them and he had to use pliers to tie up uh, the laces boots because he didn't have shoelaces, he had wire. And he would walk and, and get to this little camp, this gravel pit two hours early because the man would hand out how many shovels, how many workers he needed that day. And he always wanted to be in first in line. And I call it the boot story. So I have family stories, other family stories that motivate me, the good part of my family, even if they struggled and were poor. Because uh, that, that guy, that grandfather was a sharecropper and eventually he read books and became a carpenter. So I think I try to look at positives for my family. And then I try to have the focus and vision. So I've already told you, try to live beneath your means. Um, and some of you are going to be handicapped, or many of you, because you're going to graduate with debt. But I would say, get your education, study, make the highest grades that you can, try to get the best job that you can, and uh, it, it, try to make good moves. I, I had a cousin who graduated from college, and back then we couldn't wait to get an apartment. And I just said, hey, well, why don't you live with your mom and dad for a year? Apartments, I think, then was $500 a month. I said, save $500. I said, at the end of the year, you have about 5000 6000 and you can get a house. Of course, this was like 30, 40 years ago, but the dynamics could be the same. So if you're going to work in a Metroplex, maybe you stay home for a year, save the money that you would spend on an apartment, then you, then you have money to maybe buy a home. So try to make those decisions. Um, if you could buy the used car instead of the new, new car, um, and just, just try to have the discipline and the focus of where you want to be. Uh, I always set goals. I would have my 10-year goals, what I want to do in my 20s. It was different when I got to my 30s. It was different when I got to my 40s. And so, uh, but having my, my focus on what, where do I want to go? Where do I want to be? And if you really, really, if I want to be, if you want to be an attorney, it's like you, you if that's your goal and, and you begin to make decisions to move in that direction, you will get there. You will get there. So focus, get some family stories that will motivate you and stay the course, stay the course. Thank you for that answer again, Mr. Parrish, and thank you for that question, Yesenia. Um, I want to reiterate what he said. Live beneath your means. Write that down. Make wise decisions. Write that down. Be disciplined and have goals. Have goals, because if you don't have any goals, you're sure to achieve them. And there's some goal setting theory that you should be aware of in the College of Business. Hard, specific, attainable goals. Um, mm -hmm. Really good advice. Thank you for that. OK, I saw a question in the chat that I'm looking back has been there for quite some time. So let me ask that before we get Ife to call in another student. And thank you for that, Ife. Um, it's Perfa Jishing ask Mr. Parrish, what sort of methods do you use for your business networking? I'll just ask with that business networking. OK. Um, first, guys, I didn't do well my first few years because I had tunnel vision. Anybody that knows uh, Pleasant Grove, my first two restaurants were about three miles apart on a Buckner Boulevard. And I was just back and forth, up and down the street. And I did network with customers and employees, but I was just focused on um, trying to run my businesses the best that they could be. Since then, I've grown to, um, and a lot of it is because of the philanthropy, to, to meet people and, and, and network, so to speak. So, um, I give you an example of networking that's maybe closer to home than you. So I have a daughter who we're Texans. She did go to undergrad at Purdue, which is 900 miles away. But when she decided she wanted to go to graduate school, I felt that it would be best from a networking standpoint for her to get a graduate degree from a college in Texas. And I said, beyond a master's degree, we want to develop continue to develop relationships. So to me, that that, that kind of relates to you. She's, she's like 29, so 
the master's degree is about the master's degree, but it's about a master's degree from a university in Texas to make the relationships. Uh, there was an award, there's an organization that they give out like these business awards and they have like 10 or 12 businesses. Um, it's the, uh, the Dallas Black Chamber. And they had some of the alums myself on and they wanted to talk about what was one of the key things about that organization. I said, trying to network with other businesses. So if I see that there's an opportunity now, I just, just try to network with, um, to me, individuals that, is there something positive that could come from this relationship? So, so those are some things. And may, maybe that deciding if you're gonna, if you're gonna go to California, get your master's degree from a university in California so that you begin to network in California or if you're going to be in Texas from there. So that's just something to think about. Not that you have to, you could get a degree in California and come back to Texas, go to New York. Uh, but I just thought that was good advice for my daughter. So. Um, great sure advice. Great. Yes. great advice. Thank you. Very interesting and thoughtful. Thank you very much. OK, Ife, you see somebody else with a hand up? Yes, yeah, so Alexis, I believe you have a second question. Do you have a second question, Alexis? Yes, I had a second question um, specifically talking to kind of piggyback off of what Yesenia said and then possibly the person before. Um, whenever I know you said you did community outreach and you're doing scholarships, you're sponsoring um, chess teams and the YMCA and stuff like that. Have you ever thought about doing uh, a community outreach where you're helping kids maybe learn about financial literacy or even giving advice the same advice that you would give your daughter about the master's degree and built networking within their community, just helping people that don't have those people like their parents. They don't have that knowledge already. They're not giving that knowledge to their children. You're a businessman within the community that can help those people in the community help get out. Yeah, and so to answer that. I have a full time job running my business, and so in order to to make that happen, I have to partner with people. So I mentioned the junior achievement and I have committed where probably three or four times a year, I will uh, present some kind of seminar, uh, business related, budgeting related, finance related with them. And there are different programs in different communities that people, people have come to me where I sponsor it and maybe I come one day, may, it might be a summer program. So I, I, I look at those where it's, I'm a sponsor because I only have so much time. And if it looks like it's a good program, I'll, I'll help uh, fund part of it or you know, help it from a financial standpoint, then make an appearance where I can make some points with the youth. So I do that quite a bit. Um, I just can't do it full time. So uh, I do look at proposals and if I could fund them and they make sense, I do that. So that's, that's where, where I come from. Oh, can I, I was gonna make this interjection. The, the young lady had asked me what I enjoy doing. So Dr. Bell, I'm not sure who it's going to be, but I'm going to enjoy writing that $3,000 check to help somebody with a scholarship. So I enjoy that too. So I like that, Paul. We'll enjoy that as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. And I'm not the undergraduate student who's going to get it. OK, so any more questions from the undergraduate Sorry. students? Yes, Luis. Luis. Had a Luis question? already asked a question. Luis, do you have another question? Is there somebody who has no has not asked a question yet? I have a question. Say your name, please. Um, my name is Kennedy Engelbrecht. I'm going to turn my camera on too. <laughs> um, hi, Mr. Parrish. So I just have a question of what is the difference? I don't want it to sound dumb, but what is the difference between a small business and a big business? And is working for a small business better than a big business? Or is it just the per person's preference? OK, a small business. you know. The government has has a definition of small business as something like anything over, um, I don't know, something really low, like fifty million dollars. Something. I mean, that's that could be astronomical, but it puts me in a category where I have to compete with like Exxon Mobil, um, Campbell Soup, General Motors, um, and I just felt that there should be a middle of the road. Uh, we talk about the middle class. There should be a middle class of business. Um, and once I had an argument with uh, a brief argument with President Obama about that. And so if I ever come to speak to you live, I'll throw up a slide and, and say how that went. So 
I mean, really small businesses, obviously, are the mom and pops. And I even say that a business my side, which which I, I see myself as like a, a mid, mid range, we have different needs. I'm not seeking an SBA loan or a small business loan, but then I'm, I am not competing with Bank of America or, or some, some large um, uh, restaurant chain for uh, if I need financing. Um, I, I'm probably gonna be off on the statistics, but I think the 70, 80% of the economy in the United States is really small businesses, probably under a hundred million dollars in revenue. And usually with a smaller business, and of course they're bad apples, but you probably have, have I mean, you, you could talk all the way up to the CEO because they're gonna be smaller, smaller businesses. So I think there are advantages, there are advantages in corporate America. The one thing about corporate America, I would say try to go to the strongest company you can initially because you could build up your finances and in the, in the old days, they had matching programs. So you could save, say, up to 10% of your salary and the company would match it with 10% and if they have stock options. And so that's what I did for my 13 years to build up the monies to buy the franchise. So I always try to go with the strongest company that you can when you graduate and have your eye open for what, like, what kind of niche you're going to look at. I actually was going to leave Exxon and become a CPA. And then I filled out the application was rejected. So that became a mission. But after X number of years in corporate America, I didn't think that I was going to have a 30 year career in corporate America. So I kept my eyes open. Watch trends. I'm going to say this, Dr. Dr. Bill, and turn it back to you. Watch trends. A lot of the companies that were thriving when I was coming up, Sears and Roebuck was our Amazon. Um, Pontiac. Um, gosh, I think Oldsmobile. There are a lot of companies that have gone out that were uh, staples. Uh, Howard Johnson's uh, names, you, Montgomery Wards names you probably have never heard. And believe it or not, the Amazons, the Googles, the Apples, you may in your lifetime see those companies disappear. So watch trends on, on, on what's, what's a good area to go, to go to as far as your career path. I mean, healthcare, we're all getting older in America. So healthcare to me is, is a good area to think about and look at. Okay, thank you for that astute response. I, I wanna reiterate again, watch trends. That's pay attention to what's going on in the world. Pay attention. Thank you for that question, Kennedy, and thank you for turning your camera on to ask the question. Okay, Ife, do you have another person? You're on okay. mute. Yeah, <laughs> Melissa said she had another question, so I think that's it for now. Uh, so what motivates you to go above and beyond at work? Wait, go again? Uh, so what motivates you um, to go above and beyond at work? Okay. Um, what I mentioned to you, to you uh, young students and faculty officers about like having stories in your family that motivate you. Believe it or not, that boot story, and I know I didn't explain it very well, but when I, I think about my grandfather, I think about my father, I worked 13 years for Exxon and I missed three days and I was proud of it. And my father said he worked 30 years for U.S. Steel in Gary, Indiana and missed three days. And so um, even though they're, they're deceased, it's, it's the pride of, of, um, of, to me, my last name that I stand for them. And I want, I want to achieve for them. Uh, I'm, I'm, things that I do now, I'm trying to pass that to, to my children and other relatives um, to say, okay, we begin to build a parish name in, in Dallas. Let's try to, to go forward. Uh, so it's that enterprise. Um, I, I don't want to be the person to brag on me. I'd rather have other people brag on me or family to be proud of me than me, me to brag. But I, I do love to achieve. I do love to help people. Luke 1248, to whom much is given, much is required. I know what my, my mission, my, my ministry is to help people. Uh, that's why I say I'm going to have fun writing a check. And who knows, we may decide to give a couple scholarships instead of one. And and those are the things that motivate me to look back and say, last my last point, in order to get in McDonald Land, you have to memorize a lot of things. You have to memorize. I would ride a bus in Houston for an hour, part of my commute, and I would have flashcards that I would go through all these things you have to memorize. Like, what's the temperature that you, the shortening is for fries? 336 degrees. 
How long does it cook? Three minutes and 12 seconds. When do you shake the basket? 30 seconds. You know, you had all, all the products you have to learn and have flashcards. And I had no employees. And now I sit back and I look. I have about 1,400 employees and, and a business that's ranked number four in North Texas. And so that motivates me, but it makes me feel good that, hey, Roland, you built this. I mean, with, with, with the grace of God and some good luck and some good genetics. So those are things that motivate me. But to help people, that's my ministry, to help people. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Melissa. And that was another good one. And thank you for that inspiring answer, Mr. Parrish. Um, OK, so Luis had another question that it was the second question. I was hoping to get more first questions. But Luis, if you still have your second question, please answer. Ask it. Yes, good afternoon uh, to Mr. Parrish. Uh, my question to you is uh, for those young adults, I think you were um, saying it earlier uh, to um, to go out there, right, and meet people and, 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 and connect with other people. Would you say to young adults that are coming out from school, um, like me, undergraduates, to go and to um, get um, register, I wouldn't say register, but come um, bec uh, become partners or become um, uh, Oh my God, I forgot the question. <laughs> um, become um, part of some uh, some groups, uh, professional groups like engineers um, or like chefs, so that way they can explore and expand their um, uh, their community and their and their friendships. Yeah, I think absolutely. I, I am naturally a recluse, so I don't need a lot of people. That's why I said my my first couple of years, I, I I was a tunnel vision in, in building my organization, and I realize now that. Um, Sometimes you have to go to lunches and listen to people and talk to people just um, because good. A lot of times you may just come away with ideas from people. I learned, learned to be a good listener. Uh, so when you graduate, I, th I think, or even before you graduate, I think it's good to begin your networks, begin the organizations that you become part of. And, and one of, one of the, uh, to me, significant things about going to, to college is not, not, in addition to education, is to begin to mix with people in different cultures. I just tell two sentences on what, what could be a, a five minute story. I was a track and field athlete and undergraduate. I didn't realize that there were guys on the track team who were pilots. Purdue made the NIT tournament in New York and these guys rented a plane and flew themselves to the NIT finals. I didn't know how to rent a car at that time. I mean, where do you rent a plane? Where do you buy gas? Where do you park it? And so that was my freshman year. And after that, I made sure that I knew what everybody did on the track team. Well, what what was their uh, major? Um, because that was new to me. Teammates who were pilots in high school. I had teammates that a few years later they were robbing liquor stores. So so it's good to to make sure you you socialize and interact with people even just on campus. But yes, you got to interact with people to to broaden your horizons. Okay, Ife, another question. Do you see another hand? I do, but there are also some questions in the chat. Um, one from Alexis Jackson asking about, so she's, uh, you talk about your success so far and how you set goals and accomplish them. What goals do you have set for yourself now? Mm. Um, the true goals I have for, for myself now is, um, one, one is with my daughter who, um, I told you she's getting an MBA from a Texas school and to uh i've started a real estate company that i want her to to head up and then i have a, a nephew who happens to have the last name parish who's interested in the restaurant business and so he's training in california and i'd like to begin to tra to transfer in the coming years some of the restaurants to him so he can continue that legacy so mm -hmm. those are the goals i have now which is i guess you said that's uh succession planning are some of the things that i, I really will look at um as far as goals and I, I have a goal that i mean through exercise and diet that hopefully i can remain healthy to see these transitions happen so, so those those are my goals right now it's really a succession planning great thank you um i know Frappa, you've asked the question so i'm going to ask caitlin to um, ask her question and then see if we have some time for yours as well sure Hello, I'm Caitlin McDonald. I'm an undergraduate. So Mr. Parrish, I had a quick question. Do the experiences you learned from your 
family, so about like the boot story and like the experiences that you've learned along the way help you in your role today? Yeah, I would say all of, all of the things may boil down to, I don't think I've talked about this, about being humble. Um, I always say, if, if I walked into UTA today and this was like on campus and it could be a large room or a small room, I'd walk in and I'd, I'd sit probably on the back row until somebody asked me to come forward. Because there's, there's been times I've gone in and go to the front row and they asked me, to, hey, what are you doing up here? You need to, you need to move back. So uh, kind of a funny story, but, but I, I've learned to be humble um, and, and not take things for granted, to be confident, but not cocky and uh, try to respect people. And uh, that, that's a lesson that I've learned. Just, just be humble, be studious, um, sit back and try to have a strategy on, on, uh, on situations and get up every day and just try to do a good job every day. Okay, thank you for that question, Caitlin. And as far as respecting time, it's 3.56 and we are, we borrowed, we asked for an hour of Mr. Parrish's time and I don't want to go over that time. I wanna thank you very much for that. And I wanna really let you know how much we appreciate your coming to spend your time with us. And you mentioned if you ever come to speak to us live, you'll share the Obama story. We would love to hear that. <laughs> Um, we would love to hear that and we would love to have you come speak to us live, perhaps in the fall when things are much better. We would welcome you and I, I see how many people are here today and I know how much they've been graced with your presence. And thank you so much for the advice that you've given and for the scholarship that you're going to give to one of our students. We appreciate it very much. Um, thank you and I guess that's it. It's 357. I don't want to run over. So thank you so much. Thanks everyone for coming. And we have a lot more business week sessions this week. So I hope that you all will come. There's one at six o'clock and a few more, one on Friday at noon. So please come. Thank you all. Okay, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parrish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parrish. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Parrish. Yes, yeah, send in a message. Bring Parrish to campus. <laughs>